And welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Red Hat Summit 21 virtual conference. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here, here with Kevin Martelli, principal software engineer, KPMG. Join the conversation, Kevin, great to see you. Uh, thanks for coming on. John, thanks a lot for having me. So obviously Red Hat, a lot of action, cloud native, um, part of IBM now, a lot, a lot of talk going on around this growth around cloud. Massive new opportunities, new modern applications being shaped in, super exciting opportunities. So first, before we get into, the, into all that, tell us about your role at KPMG. Sure, John, thanks. So my role at KPMG, I'm one of our cloud leaders at KPMG, where I really help both from an internal perspective, so helping our internal enablement and digitalization, as well as more importantly, helping to deliver um, solutions and, and um, applications to our clients as they go through these digital journeys and really focusing on containerization and enablement through the cloud. You guys have done a lot of AI work, I know, which is cutting edge, it's pretty much data driven. I mean, AI is, I mean, what everyone talks about, but underlying AI is automation, data, machine learning, you know, really dealing with kind of new types of data sets, not just dealing with existing structures. Um, you have a new platform called Ignite. Tell us what that is. What do you guys solve? What was the problem statement and what's, the, what's, what's going on with it? Yeah, John, thanks a lot for asking. So. Ignite um, is something that we developed internally initially and was really helped to solve our AI um, initiatives. We called it our AI platform, but it's more so an ecosystem. And it, it solves not only our own internal needs and internal use cases, but also it's used to help you know, support and uh, deliver these solutions to clients. Um, one of the foundational principles of our platform is it's built on top of containerization, which we know is a, is a hot area now today in the marketplace really gives you the ability for scalability, flexibility, security, et cetera. Uh, but more important, what we're seeing large scale of adoptions in our clients is using this platform to really get value out of both unstructured and structured data um, in a way that they're able to do this in a secured fashion and then easily get it deployed. It's a, it's a pretty scalable platform and something that has just recently received the patent for it. So what was, the, what was the internal conversation to put this together? Was it the fact that there was business needs, um, cloud native gave you that scale advantage? What was some of the drivers behind Ignite? Cause this is like, was it IOT? Was it, what, what, take us through the mindset. What was some of the first principles around building this? Yeah, John, Max, that's a good question. And, and actually to be, to be fair, this was probably a little bit before the time of IOT and some of these newer <laughs> technologies were coming up. And, at this time, we were really kind of scratching on the surface of data science and advanced analytics. And what really generated the need for this is, as you can imagine, working at a consultancy firm, and many of our clients deal with, with tons of contracts and the LIBOR documents for financial services. There was so much rich information in these unstructured data documents, and we had no way to get this information out. So really it was generated out of a need to get information out of a lot of these contractual documents that we had and pinpoint specific information. So really taking it holistically on ingestion, on transformations, running NLP algorithms, it really evolved into a whole end-to-end -end complete platform, you know, running on top of a containerized ecosystem such as OpenShift. Yeah, I mean, I think just not to go on a tangent here, but I think one of the conversations we've been having on all these events and certainly with COVID was the highlight of all these silos. And you know, the old, day, the old days was, oh, well, break down the silos, but now with containers and, and cloud scale, you can ex extract out data kind of create that horizontal data plane, if you will, or view observation space, some call it. I mean, this just seems to be a huge trend. You guys were on it early. Um, how is that? What's your take on that? I mean, the silos used to be kind of like an advantage if you had a monolithic application, but now you have a lot of diverse distributed databases. What's your take? Yeah, it's, it's good. And what, how we are kind of coining it is really through the power of you know, some of the tooling and open chip that really gives organizations the ability to defer risk, right? In the sense that allows you to run certain types of workloads on-prem in a private cloud containerized way. It allows you to burst certain other types of workloads you know, into the different CSP providers. So you can get advantage of their scale, of their capacity without maybe moving some sensitive data. And then another benefit with some of that vendor locking that sometimes you know clients are concerned about is being able to kind of easily deploy your workloads and applications from one cloud provider to another. And I think as we look at this distributed processing, no one client <clears throat> will totally be in one cloud provider. So having the ability to move workloads quickly and fastly where they make sense, where the security and risk is, is, is aligned is something that would, would make uh, successful use cases deployments. So let me ask you the question, you guys, um... KPMG also have your own big data effort going on with analytics. You got clients that you serve and ultimately they have customers as well. So you have that Red Hat equation. 
What mm. are some of the advantages um, that you guys see at, at your mm. firm and your clients with mm. Red Hat Analytics? Because this is this becomes ultimately the number one conversation. It's like, okay, what's in it for me? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. <clears throat> I would say we're seeing a few things. Um, some of them are highlighted. One is, as you're well aware, we chose uh, Red Hat's OpenShift as one of our strategic options to deploy our client platform. And you know, whenever you're deploying these platforms, it's very important that you have the, the flexibility, the agility, and the ability to scale. And, and, and Red Hat underneath the hood really helps take care of a lot of that you know, for you in a way that not only can you do it on your own, as you mentioned earlier, your private cloud, but also onto the public CSPs and multiple CSPs. In addition, some of the other things I think that we saw that were very beneficial, you know, a lot of times as an application user, so application users of Ignite, the developers, the data scientists, the, um, the business users, the analysts, you know, they all need to interact with the platform. They want to worry about getting the insights, about getting the efficiencies of the platform. They don't want to worry about how, how the infrastructure is being put together, you know, how the, <clears throat> how the workloads are being moved, how the scalability is occurring, et cetera. And, and Red Hat really takes a lot of that away from, from you having to worry about it. And, you know, one of the other, I think things that's also important is, is you know, we have a strategic relationship with, with, with um, Red Hat. And as we look to help to enhance and develop these capabilities and experiences as our clients are doing private cloud, hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, we're really going to be able to let them take the power of you know, open source you know, into their own control and how they want to deploy it themselves. Well, I got you on the topic there. I got to ask you the question, what would you say to the people out there that haven't really kicked the tires on Red Hat in a while? What's the modern update? How would you describe the current situation at Red Hat for people who are going to relook and or uh, mm -hmm. bring the Red Hat conversation up, up a notch? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question. I, I think we see this in any type of software in the industry today. There's so many choices and there's so many options out there. And how do you choose the right source for the right use case, you know, for the right client, the right company. And how we always like to talk with clients is that, yes, there are a lot of choices in there in the orchestration for containerization. But when you're looking for something best to breed in the market, that has the, the security built into it that many organizations are looking for, that gives you the flexibility without having to do a lot of additional operational overhead of moving from on-prem into the cloud and the way that it can scale and kind of make the overall ecosystem operations and deployments easier. It's one of the benefits we see of going with a, a tool like Red Hat OpenShift. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate the comments there and uh, on Red Hat, that's awesome. Red Hat Summit, obviously a big event around Red Hat and future cloud and modern applications. So I got to ask you as a software engineering uh, leader in the industry, you got to be pretty excited about artificial intelligence and machine learning as it relates to, you know, what it can be doing for changing the software development paradigm. Obviously you, there's also no code, low code, serverless, mm -hmm. you got cloud native, you got containers, you get all this new capability. Um, so how does, how do you see those trends? What are the big um, trends around machine learning and AI as it relates to someone who's going to be building modern applications in the cloud? Because certainly there's a huge ups, upside there. You know, some are saying that if you don't have AI, um, that's mm -hmm. going to be a table stakes and will lower the valuation of the software or the application. What's your, what's your take on all these big trends around AI? Yeah, I agree with that. And we've actually done several studies and, and what we're hearing industry leaders saying is, is, is quite a few things. One is um, <clears throat> we at KPMG coined COVID-19 whiplash. <laughs> and, and really what that means is that the pace and acceleration of adoption in AI has been tremendous over the COVID-19 period of our pandemic period. And so much so that industry leaders are a little bit concerned about how fast this adoption is going and is it going too fast. Um, in addition, we recently published a, a study called Th Thriving in an AI World, where we were able to um, identify that business leaders and insiders are really bullish on, to your point, of using you know, AI and ML to make some core critical decisions. How can we make vaccines? What's the distribution process? You know, fraudulent analytics for um, you know, financial services. Uh, however, what I will say is we're still seeing a lot, a lot of questions and challenges around AI, its security it's ethics associated to it, right? How can you manage it and govern it in your process? Then privacy associated to it. So there's a lot of um, points around those areas. I think that industries are still trying to struggle and, and figure out how to solve for. And one of the things that we are hearing is that with the new administration, you know, there's different, you know, think tanks and industry leaders that are feeling that 
the new administration, while open to a lot of these advanced techniques and technologies, are going to put a little bit more rigor around and regulations around how AI can be used in the marketplace. So hopefully that will give some companies guidance around these security and privacy and ethics concerns. Yeah, that's interesting. I was talking to a friend the other day who's a leader at a, at a big uh, company that's a customer of Red Hat and a lot of other clouds as well. And we were we were joking about the agility, speed, oh, agility and speed. Of course, yeah, mm -hmm. you get that with here. But you got a lot of fast and loose situations going here. You got to know when to put the pedal to the metal, when there's a straight and narrow where you can really kind of gas it with AI and machine learning. Mm -hmm. And then know where the potential curves are, if you will, to use that metaphor. Um, because you can go fast, but with speed comes dangerous new things for breakage is always, and you're seeing that all the time. You're seeing that, you know, with, with software because you could push a new update, but still when you talk about operational integrity and security, you know, fast and loose isn't always the best way to go. But when you, it, but if you know there's a straight and narrow, you can really push it. Um, this is was the, what we were saying is like, Hey, we know when to go straight and narrow and go fast. And then when to slow it down, pull it back. What's your take on that? What's your assessment? No, I, I agree. I, I think you, you hit some valid points there. And and sometimes what we do is we take some antiquated processes and we overlay them into these newer technologies and we try to think them as being the same way. And they may not always hold true, but it's not only, you know, kind of the fast and narrow and then putting things in it may be a little bit more simplistic, but it's also, there's a whole change around how you productionalize. How do you get these things into deployment? How do you monitor these over time? So some of those biases or some of those privacy concerns don't end up creeping up into the algorithm over time. I still think that what we're hearing from industries, there's still struggles around that. There's still struggles around, there's a lot of technologies that can do a lot of these same things. Our business processes don't always align. And then how do we really take something from an innovation from a POC into production, right? Is there a fast track for something that is straight and narrow and something that has a little bit more complexity? But what we're seeing today is a lot sort of follow the same road, which makes bringing more complex AI algorithms into production challenging. Yeah, and there's always that big trend of day two operations, which is, hey, you deploy, it's great. And then, okay, wait a minute, stuff's starting to break. We need better monitoring. We need better data analytics. What's instrumented, what's not, what services are being generated and terminated. These are all big cloud native kind of themes. Uh, with that, I got to ask you from, the, from a customer standpoint, these are new first generation problems at yeah. scale at, at, with, the, with this new cloud native environment, the pros and cons. How do you guys talk to customers? What are some of the things you're seeing around the challenges that they face with analytics, all this analytic activity? Yeah, so I, I think one of the challenges, and we've probably heard this year in, year out, is around data literacy, right? Like really having our folks understand the data and empowering them to be successful in the organization. And to be fair, I would say data literacy was a little bit more narrowly focused in organizations who needed it. I need some analysts to use it. I needed some, you know, data scientists, engineers. But what we're starting to see now is there's larger programs across the board where the, it's more holistic at an organizational level. Everyone should be involved in data. Everyone should be able to do their own reporting. So really data literacy and getting data kind of into the arms of the, the folks is, is important. Um, some of the other ones that, that, that we've also kind of talked to about and they kind of go hand in hand and maybe a little bit on our prior conversation was the technologies. Technology, especially in open source is exploding, is, is exploding as well as commercial, right? So how do you choose the right technologies, the right tools, you don't have too many you know, tools in your toolbox per se, but use the ones that are really differentiating and try to standardize on the ones that are more standard. You know, finally, it's bringing those processes and that wrapping them back into the technologies. Again, a little point we hit on earlier, but what we're finding is as technology is rapidly, you know, increasing your, you're able to use it for your analytics, your processes are still antiquated and legacy processes, which makes it, you know, a little bit harder for you to really take advantage of, you know, what you're trying to achieve in your organization from a digital transformation. And then, you know, one final, one I would add in there is around the risk that organizations have, right? So there's a lot of concern about reputational risk if they're doing these types of activities that people don't understand the, the data, they don't understand the algorithms. Are there some impacts that can be had? And they're they're figuring out how to control that um, and then how not to. And then I think finally the workforce, as, as we know, it's getting the workforce up to speed, you know, retooling where need be and putting their people in the right place to be successful. Kevin, that's great insight. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. I got to ask you one final question, sure. uh, one more thing. You know, you mentioned COVID whiplash. I mean, there's a lot of post COVID activity discussions going on. If you look at what's happened with COVID, there's been an exposure of all the projects that need to be doubled down on ones that may not be <laughs> continuing. Uh, people working at home, obviously a change of the environment. You mentioned workforces among others. What do you think the biggest conversation around your customer base or within KPMG right now around 
some of these growth strategies around post-COVID, what are companies thinking around how to deploy the people, process, and technologies, big part of this conversation. What, what is the post-COVID general theme that you're seeing among, among large enterprises and, and business in general? It's a good question. So I think in general, we're seeing the acceleration of digital agendas that may have been pushed out for five years, pulling it in closer. But one of the most interesting things I think that I gathered out of working with the clients that we're working with is that, um, you know, before to get stuff into production, AI solutions, even, even any type of smaller production system, it was taking months, you know, months, several months to get something in production. And it seemed to be once the COVID pandemic hit, you know, organizations can accelerate that journey of deployment of applications into production in very, very quick timeframes without, you know, hindering or impacting any types of control frameworks that they have in place, but just working quicker. So I think some of the things I see as we move forward is that these digital agendas are going to be pulled forward more quicker. The, the, the day list a POC is good or a pilot's good is long past. It's now they want to see the results and the outputs and the enterprise in production. And I think they realize that they have the tools to do this in a period of time that is weeks versus months and in some cases years. So would you agree then just as a quick follow up to that, that obviously when we get back to real life post COVID that the visibility and the economics and the productivity gains from this new environment is going to stay around longer and be permanent. What's your, do you agree with that statement? I hope it, my hope it is, but we are creatures of habit and sometimes <laughs> we go back to back to the way that we have done things. But I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that they were able to see to be successful in these types yeah. of environments and, and make these types of decisions that those processes start evolving to take into consideration what we learned during this terrible pandemic and be able to apply that to post pandemic. Yeah, who would have known the word hybrid cloud actually means something more than just cloud technologies, hybrid <laughs> events, hybrid workforces, the yeah. word hybrid has been kicked around. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE here from Red Hat Summit coverage. Thanks for coming on, great insight. Thank, Thank you. you, have a great day. Thanks. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here for Red Hat Summit coverage 2021 virtual. Thanks for watching.